Last chance. Twenty twenty one. Uh, to start us off this afternoon, I'd like to introduce you to Joe Petrowski, who will be joining us virtually. Joe leads technical integrations at Web3 Foundation, where he ensures that teams ranging from parachains to wallets and custodians have the tools and resources needed to connect to the Polkadot and Kusama networks. He's also a host of the Relay Chain podcast. Uh, prior to working at Web3 Foundation, Joe was a research analyst at Parity Technologies and spent several years working in the satellite launch industry. Two fun facts I learned about Joe when I was speaking to him prior to the conference is that he's originally from New Hampshire and that he was previously a semi-professional cyclist riding for a couple of English and French teams. I thought that was interesting. Please give a warm in-person to the virtually streamed Joe Petrowski. Hey, Joe. Hi, thanks for having me. Nice to see you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Excellent. Yeah, You're all right? good to go. Cool. Thanks. Have fun. Um, sorry, I, I couldn't make it there in person. I actually bought plane tickets and then Switzerland put a bunch of uh, entry restrictions and, and quarantine requirements on travel, even from EU countries. Um, so I, I decided to stay at home last minute. Um, anyway, I'll get into a uh, presentation here. Yeah. I am here. The question is, are you here? Yeah, can there you see you this all right? <laughs> we can. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I want to talk about uh, unstoppable applications, uh, which is something uh, we've been working on building on Polkadot. And I guess like part of the, the context of this is, is a few things. One, that a lot of people talk about decentralization uh, but it's kind of a, it's a hard thing to, to pin down. Is it about the miners or validators? Is it about community? Is it about governance? Um, so, and then like, you know, other kind of like RPC inf infrastructure, for example, in Fura. So it's kind of a hard thing to define. Um, and I, we like to think about it as more on the top in the, the opposite rather than saying like, is this thing decentralized? Um, is it unstoppable? So could somebody come in and take out one piece of critical infrastructure and uh, take this system offline? And so we've been thinking a lot about like the, um, the primitives required to, to develop uh, a network that allows for unstoppable applications. So we break this down into uh, four pieces, I would say. Um, the first being peer-to-peer, -peer, um, the second upgradability, the third, uh, unlimited in design space, and the fourth, uh, fee-less. And uh, I don't mean completely uh, free to use, uh, but I'll get into a little bit what each of these mean in a little bit more detail. Uh, so when I talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, um, this is kind of what you would call like decentralization, uh, removing as many single points of failure as possible. So, um, and this is more about like a, a network topology than other forms of decentralization, uh, for example, with, with governance or, or something else. So um, we've really designed uh, Polkadot and Substrate, the, the actual toolkit that you would use to develop uh, blockchains in the Polkadot network on, uh, to be as peer-to-peer -peer as possible. So uh, one of the primary things we're working on is uh, light clients, and those can actually be used in browser or on a mobile device. And so that removes the need for RPC services like Infura uh, because you don't really have to trust a, an archive node or a full node from somebody else. You don't need to run your own full node. And uh, I know my whole talk is only 15 minutes and I think every single slide could spend uh, half an hour talking about. Uh, but the way this works is it actually keeps just the client that tracks the block headers in your browser. Um, and this can be done in just a couple hundred megabytes uh, rather than keeping the entire transaction history and because your, your browser in, through the light clients can actually tell which block is final, uh, it can use an RPC service like Infura um, to get the actual data from without having to trust that data. So uh, it doesn't have to host the, your, your own uh, client, doesn't have to host the data itself, but it can still access the data from blockchains in a trustless way. So uh, we're working on things like browser extensions and mobile apps where you could actually run a light client uh, right in browser and you're, when you use like a user interface, you'd actually be working through your light client uh, rather than depending on some uh, centralized entity uh, like, like a service provider to provide access to full nodes. Um, 
And, and we also have done a lot of work dating back several years on a scalable consensus. So right now the Kusama network runs with 1000 validators, which is way more than any other proof of stake uh, BFT network, which oftentimes come, come in our, at around one or 200 validators. And this has a lot to do with the work that we've done, um, especially with the grandpa algorithm, uh, which can finalize blocks in batches rather than just one at a time. So if you look at like a typical uh, Byzantine fault tolerant finality algorithm, it would have to run its algorithm every single block and it can't really advance to the next block until it has done that. And what we've done is actually isolated those two processes, uh, one being block production. So it, the system can keep generating blocks at a constant interval. Um, but if the actual finalization gets a little bit behind, it doesn't have to do one block at a time. Uh, it can actually finalize a batch of blocks. So uh, if the finality gets like 10 blocks behind the production, it could actually just finalize all 10 of those blocks uh, in one round. And so this consensus has allowed us to increase the validator set by, by quite a lot and make sure that we have a really diverse set of entities who are running validators in the network. Uh, the next is upgradable. So this is uh, really important to the underlying design of Polkadot and, and Substrate in general. So we define Polkadot as a meta protocol. And in that sense, it is a protocol that describes another protocol. Um, and so if you kind of look at like how a hard fork would work in other networks, um, for example, in Ethereum, the Ethereum clients that like a miner runs or, or a full node would run actually contain the instructions that define Ethereum. Um, and so when you want to change those instructions, uh, somebody has to release a new client, a new version, and then convince all of these people to upgrade. And so it gives a lot of other people power, um, for example, miners, because you could have a lot of um, community support. Uh, and that's a very vague thing to define, like what is the community? Um, you could have a lot of support from uh, token holders or um, the core developers of the protocol to make some upgrade. Uh, but just a handful of miners, I think 16 uh, mining pools contain 90% of Ethereum hash power. Um, a few of them can decide not to actually upgrade that software and it will never happen no matter how, um, no matter how much everybody else agrees on it. And so the way that Polkadot and Parachains are designed is that the actual client itself only runs an execution host. It's a lot like um, your browser, like Google Chrome, uh, and it can host lots of different websites. Well, our client um, can host lots of different blockchains. And so the really the thing that I like, kind of make fundamentally makes parachains work in the Polkadot network is that they have to be expressible in this language called WebAssembly. Um, it, it's kind of like what, what your browser would run. So if you run Firefox or Chrome, uh, it, it uses WebAssembly to make like interactive components. And so we use the exact same technology um, in, in our clients to express the Polkadot protocol. So all of the things about like staking parachains, balance transfers, uh, governance, all of this is actually expressed in a WebAssembly executable that's stored on the chain itself. So rather than storing this in the clients and getting people to upgrade, we can actually uh, just store those instructions on chain. And those, what kind of makes us especially uh, very meta is that those instructions can contain the instructions for how to change themselves. So since the instructions are just stored as a storage item um, on the blockchain, then the blockchain itself can contain the instructions of what conditions have to be met in order to uh, change those instructions. So um, they can actually, like parachains in the network can actually upgrade without having to get anybody to upgrade any software um, that they're running for validator clients. Um, and this also allows a lot of buy-in to decisions. So uh, if you look at like kind of even on-chain governance mechanisms, they're really only as valid as people believe that they're going to be enacted. And this doesn't just apply to blockchains, it, it can apply to like, um, re like state held elections as well. And we kind of saw an example of this uh, in America last year, um, where a lot of people didn't really have faith that the results of the election would be tallied properly or would be actually carried out. Um, and, and that people would actually respect the outcome of the election. And so that degrades a lot of um, people's belief in the system. If, people don't believe that the system is going to follow the rules that it has set for itself. And um, because we actually encode all of this on chain, um, you have guarantees that it's actually going to execute, um, that the system is actually going to follow the instructions that it's been given uh, because it's not in the hands of validators or data aggregators um, to decide which chain is a fork, which chain is the valid upgrade, 
um, or, or whether or not to abide by a governance decision or not at all. Um, finally, our third unlimited. Um, so in, in Polkadot, we use a free execution model. Um, and this is in contrast to what you would see on a smart contract platform, which uses a transactive execution model. So in a transactive execution model, um, the users of that system have to actually submit a transaction to kind of wake it up. So an application developer can put their application on the system and uh, their users have to kind of wake it up. Every time they want to use it, uh, they, have to, they have to send a transaction to trigger it to do something. But the software itself, the application, can't do anything like autonomously. It can't do anything on its own. And that's really restrictive uh, for a few reasons. One, as a, uh, a developer uh, of an application, you want your application to do things at certain times and not be dependent on, for example, miners refusing to include a transaction that would wake this program up and have it actually execute some piece of logic. Um, it also makes things quite difficult for your users. Um, we don't really see this in Web2 systems like, like Google or something. They don't ask you to pay a little fee every time um, you, you use their system and have to like poke it to wake it up. The system can actually go and do things on its own um, and keep progressing even without somebody like kind of managing managing it or like going to wake it up with some kind of um, actual transaction. Um, and, and this also, a transactive execution model also gives a lot of power to uh, miners, block authors, validators, um, because they can actually order the, uh, put the transactions in an order that might be favorable to themselves. And so um, by having a free execution model, the application developer can actually say, there are some pieces of logic that have to be run uh, every block or every 10 blocks, and that has to be run in, in a certain order. Um, and, and it kind of removes a lot of this power from central providers like validators from being able to influence the outcome of these uh, state transitions um, and, and lets developers on the system actually program the system to act autonomously um, and in a completely uh, free way. Uh, and, and the final uh, dimension of this that we consider is fewest. So um, kind of going along the same analogy with Google, like Google doesn't make you have like Google tokens that you have to pay, you know, uh, 0. 0.0001 cent every time you do a search or something. Uh, it just adds a lot of boundaries uh, to the user experience. And um, when you have a network within the Polkadot network, um, you actually don't have any kind of like exposure um, to the DOT token or anything else. So it's not like in Ethereum where if you want to use ERC20 tokens, you have to still have ETH to pay transaction fees. Uh, your application blockchain actually is like its own little universe. It does Your users don't even need to know that it's connected to the Polkadot network. Um, and this lets you, to, first of all, define your own uh, fee model, but this could also mean avoiding fees altogether. So um, rather than using uh, a, a token to, to pay some fees, you could actually give users um, you know, certain uh, criteria that if they meet them, then they can actually just use the chain without any fees. So for example, if you had a, a verified identity, then you could make, say, two transactions per day. Um, and some of the, just as a more concrete example, we're looking at some of the future um, governance changes that we'd like to propose or introduce. And one of those things that we're looking at is to allow people to vote um, the first time in a referendum uh, without paying a transaction fee. So you could vote, you could place your first vote in a referendum uh, and it would be free. You'd have no, free, no fees to pay at all for that transaction. If you want to change your vote or, or update it, then you have to pay fees so that you can't just keep hitting uh, the same referendum with, with a different vote uh, you know, every two minutes and kind of spamming the network. Uh, but it, if we presume that most people will just vote once uh, in, in some uh, referendum, then we can just say, okay, well, your first vote in this is actually free and there's no transaction fee for it. So it gives a lot of power over um, how you uh, limit access to the system and prevent uh, DOS attacks. Um, and I see I have one minute left, so just a quick progress update slide. Uh, this is the last one I have. So on Kusama, we have 16 parachains that are live. Um, a lot of updates to the cross-chain messaging format and uh, transfer protocol. Uh, it's running with 1,000 validators. Uh, as I said, much, much higher than uh, any other uh, BFT system. Uh, and 25% of the total supply of uh, the token is actually locked up in parachains. So this has been a, a huge success. It's been a ton of community interest in, uh, in seeing parachains go live. Um, on Polkadot, there's one parachain that's currently live. We are finishing up uh, the final audits on the clients. Um, and 
we have five more pair exchange onboarding in a couple of weeks here. Um, and then I see I'm out of time, uh, but on the ecosystem, we have tons of uh, stuff there. I can let everybody kind of read it for yourselves. Um, but lots of stuff for chains, tons of infrastructure, wallets, block explorers, uh, indexers, uh, APIs, whether it's like a REST API or GraphQL or something, uh, tooling like Codex and, and libraries, um, and, and a few uh, substrate education programs um, that are out for people that can sign up and actually learn how to build parachains and participate in the ecosystem. Um, so that was my entire presentation, and I think I am right at time. You are right on time. That's amazing. I'm kind of impressed that all the virtual people are like, watching the clock better, you know? It's kind of impressive. Joe, I'm really sad that you're not here with us, but we know that you have to keep safe. Thank you so much, everyone. Give a warm well, a, a warm thank you to Joe Petrowski. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, thank you for having me.